NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents Aeronautics and Space Report. You are looking at a very thin section of moon rock, magnified 500 times. Scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center in California are attempting to learn more about the moon's composition and physical characteristics from these strikingly colorful pictures. This sample is a small part of the lunar material distributed among 142 investigating teams from 10 countries and the United States. In addition, Ames is trying to trace the moon's history by studying meteorite impacts on the lunar rocks, looking at organic compounds to see if the moon could sustain life, and although the possibility is very small, they are actually looking for living organisms. Dr. Cyril Ponam Peruma summed up how he and his fellow scientists feel about having the chance to test the lunar samples brought back to Earth by the Apollo 11 astronauts. To us, it's probably one of the greatest uh, scientific events, uh, I would say, in the history of mankind, almost. Uh, it is uh, the first opportunity that we have of being able to look at something uh, from a different body in the solar system. Some of the information that comes out of work like this would help us to understand some of the most fundamental questions of all science, such as the question of the origin of the universe, the origin of the solar system, the problem of the origin of life, for example. 400 miles south of Ames at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, scientist Douglas Nash tells what they are doing with their lunar material. Three types of experiments will be conducted at JPL on the lunar samples. One objective of the test is to determine whether or not there are organic molecules present in the lunar soil which, which might indicate the existence of living material, living organisms. We also hope to determine whether solar radiation has modified the surface either in chemistry, mineralogy, or in its optical appearance. In addition, the objective of the third experiment is to determine whether or not water ever existed on the moon's surface, either in liquid form or as ice or condensed volatiles. Across the country in Greenbelt, Maryland, scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center are also busy analyzing lunar samples. They too are working with moon rock sections, chips, and some of the very fine powder. Dr. Isidore Adler tells what his group has found so far. To date, the uh, electron probe examination has indicated that these rocks are made up of minerals, all of which we have at some time or other observed in terrestrial rocks or meteorites. So there are really no new minerals. What is new, perhaps, is that there is a much higher concentration of some minerals. For example, there is a mineral called ilmenite, which is an iron titanium oxide which appears to be unusually high in concentration in these rocks. This is somewhat unique as compared to terrestrial rocks and seems to indicate perhaps that at some time or other the moon was exposed, at least these surface materials, to some rather severe heating. From east to west and around the world, scientists are testing, probing, and analyzing samples returned from the moon. In January of 1970, they will meet in Houston to disclose all their findings. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents Aeronautics and Space Report. Since 1959, 73 men have been accepted into the astronaut program. 
Here, nine of those most recently selected take part in jungle training exercises at the Tropic Survival School in the Panama Canal Zone. Although all U.S. astronauts have landed in the ocean after returning from space, the spacecraft are so designed that in an emergency, they can safely come down over land. Since there is a remote possibility that this could occur, all astronauts are taught how to survive in both the jungle and the desert. During their four-day course in the wilds of Panama, the astronauts were dropped into the water in a swamp penetration exercise. Studied some of the various jungle animals at a zoo set up especially for this purpose. Took an overnight trek through the jungle. Chopped down trees for shelter and fuel. Built fires and cooked wild game. And met with some of the local Indians. At a place called Pasco, 100 miles southwest of Spokane, Washington, the astronauts took part in another intensive training course, Desert Survival. One of the first things the men had to learn was how to build a shelter to protect themselves from the hot sun. A combination of parachutes and life raft seemed to do the job. Improvise is the key word to desert survival. Here they dig a water still. By digging a hole in the sand and covering it with plastic, what little moisture there is in the soil condenses on the underside of the plastic and drips into a container. Even a crash helmet makes an acceptable shovel. Another important technique they learned was how to attract the attention of rescue airplanes. By using signal mirrors and markers, they made themselves visible from overhead. Hopefully, survival training will never have to be used. But should the contingency take place, the astronauts will be well prepared. This is the Bataan, General Douglas MacArthur's staff plane as it arrived in New York City in 1951. During the past four years, the famous General's plane has played an important part in this country's space program. After being completely outfitted with sophisticated electronic gear, it served as a simulated spacecraft, helping prepare people of NASA's manned spaceflight tracking network for Apollo missions. Although it looked like any other airplane to a casual observer, to the operators of a tracking station, it looked and acted just like an Apollo spacecraft. Three engineers aboard the Bataan played the part of the astronauts, giving network technicians on the ground an opportunity to practice mission procedures, just as though they were tracking an Apollo through space. The Bataan flew its last mission before Apollo 12. The famous plane is now being readied for retirement and will take its place alongside others at the U.S. Army Aviation Museum. This has been an aeronautics and space report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.